Researchers have long claimed that altitude training gives you a one to 2% benefit in performance. And while that doesn't seem like a lot, consider that in most one hour races that end in a sprint finish, finishing even one minute off the leader, which would typically put you far outside the top 10, is still only a 1.6% difference in time. So with that in mind, how can you use altitude training to go from mid-pack to winning? Here at Trainer Road, we dug into the science so you don't have to, and stay tuned, because there's a big plot twist to this one. Based on scientific research, here's how altitude training would make you faster. When you're at high elevation, there's less pressure, and this decreases the amount of oxygen your body takes in with every breath. Eventually, your body responds to this by synthesizing more EPO, which creates more red blood cells. Red blood cells are the oxygen-carrying portion of your blood, and the more you have of them, the more your body can sustain higher workloads for longer. In theory, once you've been at altitude long enough for your body to increase its red blood cell count, you can go back down to lower elevation with all of of that oxygen and experience a 1-2% to performance benefit. Using altitude training in this way seems almost unanimously agreed upon by elite athletes and coaches as a performance enhancing strategy, with athletes such as Matthew Vanderpool, Annemiek van Vluten, and even Tom Pidcock and many more using it just this year. So the theory is pretty simple and pro athletes do it, so it must be a solid strategy, right? Well, not exactly. When you look at the research, things get pretty complicated really quickly. In the world of scientific research, researchers will occasionally publish something that's commonly referred to as a contrasting perspective, wherein they challenge a viewpoint that is supported by a single study or a set of studies. These tend to turn into a bit of a scientific royal rumble, as the original researchers that are being challenged tend to then publish a rebuttal, supporting their original viewpoint with either more science or further clarification. In 2020, Seidmanman and Dempsey published one of these called Hypoxic Training is Not Beneficial in Elite Athletes. It challenged the research and viewpoint of Malay and Brocherie in their own contrasting perspective, hypoxic training is beneficial in elite athletes. And now, while nobody likes an argument, these do tend to be very productive at putting the rubber to the road with research and separating narrative from facts. So let's cover the main points from each side and figure out whether you should adopt or avoid altitude training and how to apply it in your training plan. In Malay and Brochery's pro-altitude training argument, the following points are made. First, there is overwhelming evidence that prolonged exposure to altitude increases your red blood cell count. And while studies haven't always been able to tie this directly to a performance improvement, that increase in red blood cell count does happen, which means there's a chance it could make you faster. You're telling me there's a chance. Second, as long as you're careful about how you are doing altitude training, and as long as you're avoiding doing it right before a key event, the performance and health risks actually seem to be quite low for elite athletes. Finally, they point to the large number of elite athletes and coaches that use this regularly as part of their training as empirical evidence that it must work. They also cover different approaches to altitude training, including live high, train high, live high, train low, live low, train high, but we'll get to all that in just a bit. So how about Sybin and Dempsey's hypoxic training is not beneficial in elite athletes? Their main contention is that there's a lack of solid research proving reliable performance improvement from altitude training. And to be honest, they kind of have a good point here. Just because something happens in the body that should improve performance in theory doesn't always mean that it actually happens. It's more complex than that. They reference a 1998 retrospective study by Chapman and colleagues that looked at data from 39 athletes that did an altitude training camp. These athletes first performed a four week training block at sea level to establish a baseline of how they'd respond to a controlled training prescription. They then went up to 2000 meters or 6,500 feet to perform another four week training block, but this time at altitude. The intensity was reduced a bit, but the overall training load was matched according to the researchers. Their improvement was measured in 5K time trial time, VO2 max, and other biomarkers like EPO concentration. While all 39 athletes saw improvement from the sea level block of training, only 17 athletes saw improvement from the altitude training. Having less than a 50% chance at positively responding to altitude training is worrisome, but they reference another study that makes it even more shaky. In 2010, Robertson and colleagues performed a study with eight highly trained runners, and they did two three-week high elevation training blocks in a Norma Barrick hypoxic five-bedroom facility. In other words, a fancy building that lets you simulate altitude and deprive yourself of oxygen. And in this study, they saw modest improvements in VO2 max and hemoglobin mass amongst all the participants, but the time trial performance was a mixed bag. They stated, there was an apparent uncoupling in the relationship between underlying improvements in physiological capacities and changes in endurance performance following altitude training in highly trained athletes. Looking a little deeper into the results, confusingly, two athletes got faster after each block, but two athletes got slower after each block. 
but the other four athletes had mixed results, meaning that if they got faster after one training block, they got slower after another. Now it's important to note that this is only one study and half the participants or only four athletes are the ones that had mixed results and no study is perfect. But these researchers did a good job of controlling as many variables as possible. And if you look at this study and take it just at face value, what it indicates is that just because you've responded positively to altitude training in the past doesn't indicate that that will happen every time. Now zooming back out to Seibenman and Dempsey's argument against altitude training, they also point out the general health risks that are associated with exposure to high altitude. And while these should be things that you consult with your doctor about and also watch very closely, Millet and Brocherie point out in their argument that there isn't significant significant scientific evidence of this adversely affecting elite athletes. Now it seems like all researchers point out the need for more tightly controlled studies with altitude training that do a better job of controlling for variables like placebo effect, matching training volume and intensity between high and low elevations, and increasing sample size to ward out individual variants. But all of that is actually really hard to do. Even tools like normobaric hypoxic facilities don't effectively allow for perfectly blinded studies because elite athletes can easily recognize when they're in a hypoxic environment. Ultimately, perhaps the most convincing argument the opposers introduce is with how individually variable the response seems to be with altitude training and with how logistically complex it can be to get to high altitude and how expensive that can be, it should not be high on the list of strategies to get faster for elite athletes. And that checks out in my experience too. Altitude tents are thousands of dollars and being up at altitude is expensive in terms of money, but also in terms of opportunity cost with your training. If you are looking to spend thousands of dollars to get faster, faster, using that to enable yourself to follow a well-structured training plan with greater consistency is likely going to deliver much more benefit. However, because we're obsessed with discovering different ways to get faster, let's just say you have access to altitude training in one form or another. How should you apply it in your training plan? First, when it comes to training periodization, it's key to remember that altitude training is meant to boost performance, but not fitness. In fact, it typically hurts fitness to a certain degree, but the idea is that the one to 2% benefit you get in performance on race day makes it all worthwhile. And because of that, if you're planning on doing an altitude camp in any other training phase than your specialty phase, forget about it. Assuming it doesn't have a detrimental effect on your fitness, it still poses an opportunity cost during those weeks in which you are doing altitude training and recovering from it. Those could be weeks where you're surpassing your limits with high quality training and recovery during the base or build phase. But instead, you'd be sacrificing those bigger gains during the early part of your training phase for a marginal gain when it really isn't going to have a big impact. Once you've got your specialty phase targeted, you need to dial in the timing a bit more so that you can time the benefits of altitude training with your goal event. The general consensus of researchers suggests timing your goal event within 7 to 14 days of returning from altitude, but finding the right window of time is going to take some personal experimentation. In Seibenman and Dempsey's perspective, they noted that some athletes feel and perform much worse than their typical sea level baselines right after returning from altitude. So you'll want to find that balance between when you feel good but still fall within that seven to 14 day window. Next, you'll have to figure out what sort of training you'll actually do during your high altitude training camp. And this is where all of that live and train high and low stuff comes in. Researchers have tested what seems like every possible combination of living and training low or high. And the general consensus seems to be that it's best for elite athletes to live high and to train low during an altitude training camp. What this means is that you should be spending at least 14 hours of each day at high altitude, and then during the remaining 10 hours of the day, you go down to low altitude at some point to execute your higher intensity training. The theory behind this is the limited oxygen availability at high altitude doesn't allow your body to do as much work. So you can't expect the same sort of gains that you'd get from that training when you are at low elevation. If you do ride at high elevation during an altitude training camp, it should only be easy rides. It's also worth stating that you should be doing absolutely everything in your power to maximize your recovery during an altitude training camp. Just being at altitude is hard on your body because less oxygen makes every process your body typically carries out to keep functioning much harder to complete. So give your body a figurative tailwind and say no to all additional forms of stress and yes to anything that optimizes your recovery. When it comes time to do your higher intensity rides, you go down to lower elevations so you can do more work and thus achieve more adaptation. 
The scientific literature doesn't seem conclusive about a specific type of interval format or power zone to focus on when you are training at low elevation. But remember that your recovery and adaptation from the training will be hampered, so this is not the time to be putting in all-time high TSS weeks. It's likely best to just stick to your plan or make slight adjustments in training volume or intensity during this altitude camp. The final point to cover is where to do this altitude camp. Ideally, your high altitude location is between 6,500 to 8,000 feet or 2,000 to 2,500 meters. And your low altitude location is somewhere below 4,500 feet or 1,300 meters, but the lower you go, the better. If you can get access to an altitude tent, you could even do this in your home if you live at sea level. Just keep in mind that your partner may not want to sleep in an altitude tent or even right next to you with all the rustling plastic and noisy motors. If you don't have access to an altitude camp, some areas to consider are Park City, Utah, Flagstaff, Arizona, Mammoth Lakes, California, Big Bear Lake, California, Cloudcroft, New Mexico, Sierra Nevada, Spain, and right here at Trainer Road HQ in Reno Tahoe. With all of that said, I can't help but question the effectiveness and relative feasibility of an altitude training camp, and it causes me to question if they're even worth trying. This seems like another case where there's a very logical mechanism that takes place within the body, but that doesn't translate to the outcome that logic would suggest every time. And we've even seen evidence of this at the highest level of our sport, with Matthew Vanderpool and his coaching staff this year wondering if the high altitude training camp he did prior to the Tour de France was at least partially responsible for his subpar performance. So in conclusion, more red blood cells should equal better performance when we're down at lower elevation. But if research shows less than a 50% chance that you would benefit from it, and all signs point to it being expensive in terms of time, money, and opportunity cost, it seems us endurance athletes should prioritize many other things ahead of altitude training blocks. As for me, I'm glad I looked into this a bit deeper, and I'm kind of surprised that it isn't questioned more often. I'm going to forego altitude training camps and instead focus all of my resources on doing every Everything that I can to be more consistent in following my trainer road training plan. I know I sound like a broken record with that, but hey, training consistently is what moves the needle above all else. So, Kay. training consistently. How about that? But how about you? If you've done an altitude training camp, did it make you feel better or worse? Are you planning on trying this out in the future? Or maybe this has changed your opinion. I want to hear from you down in the comments below. Between now and next time, head over to trainerroad.com and sign up and let it build a customized training plan for your best season yet. If you sign up now, we have a new feature that you can get access to that uses AI to accurately detect your FTP from all of your training, not just your inside rides. And it makes it so that you will never have to take another FTP test. Excellent! If you haven't already, smash the like button, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and hit the notification bell so you don't miss a single upload from us. And join us every Thursday at 8 a.m. Pacific for the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast where we tackle topics just like this. Talk to you all next time.